Throughout this series, we'll be talking a lot about relationships. However, it's important that we don't think about stakeholder relationships exactly like interpersonal ones. While there are overlaps, the relationship between an organization and its stakeholders will be different than between people. When I talk about stakeholders, what do I mean specifically? We are talking about those individuals or groups who can affect an organization or are affected by it. Let's think of some examples of types of stakeholders for most organizations. Now, not all organizations are gonna have all of these stakeholders, but many will have even more. As if it wasn't complex enough for organizations to manage relationships, with particular stakeholders, organizations are also subject to a lot of pressures because they serve multiple groups at any given time. The stakeholders can range vastly and include groups like employees, customers or clients, regulators, competitors, and the like. But even these interactions between organizations and stakeholders don't happen in isolation, rather in a web of relationships. In fact, we should think of an organization's environment as a series of overlapping networks that help to explain why organizations act, don't act, in even how they perform. How can we begin to understand the relationships between an organization and its stakeholders? Later in this series, I'll introduce a tool that will help you track and evaluate those relationships, but underlying that are these five factors that influence those relationships from an organization's perspective. First is relational valence, and this represents the positive or negative affect or liking that an organization has towards a stakeholder. Second is the history of interaction between the organization and particular stakeholders that allows for structures, expectations, and even rituals of interaction to emerge. Third, an organization's assessment of the stakeholder group's legitimacy helps us to understand the relationship. Legitimacy refers to the stakeholder's recognizability, reputation, and or expertise relevant to the organization's core work. Fourth is the power that the stakeholder has to influence the organization or its success. Finally, is the urgency of the stakeholder's interest in the organization. That is the extent to which a stakeholder's interest or influence is time sensitive or critical to the organization itself. Of course, not all stakeholders are viewed the same by the organization. So from the organization's perspective, these factors tell us how most organizations tend to judge their stakeholders. If we're really going to understand stakeholder relationship management, we have to stop thinking from the organization's perspective and think in terms of the stakeholder's perspective on organizations. We need to do this because we're living in an era where stakeholders are not only demanding different forms of engagement, but also where crises are increasingly common and stakeholder expectations of organizations are changing. These changes mean that organizations have to change the way they relate to and communicate with different stakeholder groups in competitive message environments. For example, instead of just positioning an organization as having a desirable product or service, organizations feel increasingly pressured to have more social res socially responsible value propositions. They can't just sell a product, they also have to do good. So this involves the organization being advocates. Eric Haley is an advertising researcher and was interested in understanding how consumers reacted to advocacy within the context of advertising. In particular, he was interested in how stakeholders reacted to different types of cause-related ads. These are some of the examples of the types of ads that he was interested in. Initially, he identified three perceptions in the context of advertising. First is the perception of the organization itself, and he argues that a central component of the consumer's understanding of an advocacy message was their own perceptions of the relationship between the organization and the consumer. On the whole, consumers evaluated organizations as good organizational sponsors of advocacy messages if it was recognizable and likable, if the organization understood the consumer and shared common values with the consumer. Second is the perception of organization and the issue. The relationship between the company and the advocacy issue itself was a major dimension in the consumer's understanding of advocacy advertising. 
Four themes are evident to describe this dimension, a logical association, expertise, personal investment, and a positive intent. And third was the perception of the issue and self. The third dimension central to consumers' understanding of advocacy messages was the relationship between the issue and the consumer. The four dominant themes that emerged to describe this relationship were the importance of the issue to the self, the importance of the issue to society, whether people felt like they could help, and whether people felt that nobody could help. When I first read Haley's model more than 15 years ago, it really struck me that this would relate very well to issues management, crisis, and public relations in general. And I like to think of this as the love triangle in public relations because there's always more to how stakeholders, no matter who they are and organizations, relate to one another. So drawing from Haley's work, my own work began with this very straightforward set of relationships. The model really focuses on the stakeholder's perspective and trying to understand that perspective. And the reason is simple. It is in an organization's interest to plan its communication activities around its stakeholders. So beginning with a good understanding of the stakeholder perspective will help organizations inside and outside of crises to better understand the communicative needs of stakeholders. So let's get specific about our definitions. First, this organization. Obviously, we're going to be talking about a specific organization, the one that we work for, that we study, that we advocate for or against. Second are the stakeholders. At the most basic level, researchers talk about stakeholders as any individual or group that has or believes they have some vested interest in the work that the organization does. This means that stakeholders can include a wide range of people and groups like employees, shareholders, government agencies, consumers, and even activist groups. Stakeholders certainly don't always like the organization, but there is a perceived relationship from that stakeholder perspective. Third are issues. Now this is a really broad category, but it's about the substance of what binds an organization and stakeholders together. So issues in this case can represent products and services from the organization, but it can also represent topics that the stakeholders care about. Maybe it's healthcare, the environment, or some other set of topics. What's critical for the model is that the stakeholder believes there's a direct and clear connection between the organization and the issue. From there, the question about how connected they are to the issue is also relevant. Think about issues like the baggage that comes with the relationship. If we think of this in a normal human relationship, it can be easier. For example, in a romantic relationship, partners bring with them a lot of preconceptions about what a romantic relationship is. But also what's happened in other relationships and a set of life related things matter to them. So one common challenge in relation, romantic relationships is money. Couples regularly argue over money-related issues, and that's actually cited as one of the most common reasons for a relationship ending. So as an issue, it influences the way that people see themselves, their partner, and the health of the relationship. If we connect this back to organizations, then it's easy to see that judgments about the organizations aren't just about whether they the stakeholder likes their products, services, policies, customer service, and so on. But it's also about the judgments that we make about what that company stands for, as well as its actions and behaviors. So let's dig into each of the components of these relationships in more depth. Since we're talking about issues, let's start with the relationship between organizations and issues. Stakeholders make judgments about organizations and their connection to issues that the stakeholders care about based on a number of factors. Now, research is still identifying all the factors, but these are the ones that have emerged across a large body of research, multiple authors, books, journal articles, all in the last 10 to 15 years. Remember, each of these also represents a judgment from the stakeholders perspective about the nature of the relationship between the organization and the issue. This means that there could be very different judgments by the stakeholders for different issues or types of issues about the organization. So first, let's take a look at blame or responsibility attribution. 
This comes to us from attribution theory and focuses, as you'd expect, on the degree to which the stakeholder believes the organization has control over the issue. The more responsibility the stakeholder attributes to the organization, the more likely they are to ascribe more definitive expectations on the organization related to that issue. Second, competence asks whether or not the stakeholders believe that the organization has the capacity to actually address the issue. Third, positive intention, concern, and commitment all represent value judgments from stakeholders about their belief that the organization is interested in addressing the issue. Implied in these factors is also an assumption from the stakeholders about the value that they think the organization plays on those affected by the organization's work. In this case, this is where hygiene motivation theory comes into play. Take a look at the reference in the additional resources for more on this, but suffice to say that judgments in the authenticity of an organization's motivation to act is also important. Finally, clear association also matters. If stakeholders believe there's a clear association between the issue and the organization's core business or mission, then it's also important. In the case of corporate social responsibility, for example, if an organization initiates CSR programs that are directly related to their work, then it yields more benefits. Likewise, in stakeholder relationship management, when stakeholders see a clear association between an organization and an issue, it's certainly an issue that the organization should be monitoring. Now, from an issues management or crisis management perspective, the more intensely that stakeholders feel connected to issues, the more likely that those issues are going to trigger them into action. Yet in issues and crisis research, this relationship is one that is only beginning to get a proper level of research attention with researchers like Yan Jin really focusing on how stakeholder emotion affects reactions to crises. These relationships, though, have been long established in research related to persuasion, psychology, and even learning theory. For example, Albert Bandura's research on efficacy has fundamentally shaped the way that we think about how people react to new information, changes in behavior, and the like. So while each of these attitudinal factors is relatively new to the field of issues in crisis management, they have been well established in other areas of communication and social psychology disciplines with multi-million dollar campaigns and really important social campaigns that have changed people's lives have been built off these theories. So these concepts are all used in theories like the theory of reasoned action, theory of planned behavior, social learning theory, and the elaboration likelihood model as well as the extended parallel process model. That's why it makes sense to include them when we're talking about these kinds of relationships. They predict how people react to messages and to situations. Finally, we consider the relationship between the organization and the stakeholder. This has long been the domain of public relations work, and so there is a strong body of research, theory, and practice related to these concepts. Some authors in public relations, like Tim Coombs, argue that it can be a mistake to think about public relations as relationship management because it invokes too much related to interpersonal relationship building. And in part, I think he has a point that the relationship between stakeholders and organizations is different from how we as individuals build and maintain relationships because there are different outcomes of those relationships and certainly different purposes. However, the relationship metaphor is still the best metaphor for public relations because it focuses on the challenging dynamics of negotiating personal and other interests to see what the dyad has in common, cares about, and how it feels about one another. Moreover, across research related to PR, branding, and broader research across all of corporate communications, we find that the concepts from reputation to loyalty describe what can go right and wrong in organizational and stakeholder relationships. At the same time, our understanding of all of them is constantly developing with a lot of new research in the last several years, shedding new light on this complex and interesting type of relationship. Once we understand the nature of relationships between organizations, issues, and stakeholders, then we can begin crafting targeted and specific messaging that should help the organization not only manage the relationship better, but also the issues.
There are a few things about the messaging that I want to point out. Most of the research related to the broad field of communication suggests that for messages to be effective, not only do they need to target particular groups to whom we're communicating, so they have to be both culturally and situationally appropriate, but increasingly they need to be delivered on platforms that also make sense for the particular groups. For example, since 2006, the focus on different platforms has grown substantially with more than 150 analyses of different aspects of social media and crisis alone. However, one of the critical arguments that I make is that the messages also have to have an appeal to the particular relational factor affected, that is the intersection of the issue, organization, and stakeholder. For example, messaging men from 30 to 40 years old about their favorite brand should really be different if the problem was a reputational problem versus the target audience's confidence in using the product successfully. This is something that we target in persuasive campaigns all the time, but often is ignored in issues and crisis communication. Finally, it's also important that the messages themselves be appealing and always aligned to the specific and measurable objectives just like any good campaign. Finally, we come to some of the outcomes. There are a lot of potential outcomes. However, the literature talks about three broad types of outcomes of the issues and crisis management communication processes. First, we consider behavioral intention. What's the stakeholder going to do with regard to the organization and the situation? This can relate to the issue, to the organization, or even the industry. For example, based on their assessment of the organization, are stakeholders more or less likely to make a purchase, to follow the organization on social media, or have they even built an expectation for the whole industry, good, bad, or indifferent? Second, we must consider word of mouth. We know that people today are less likely to trust organizations and media sources about organizations or events. However, we also know they trust people they know and other opinion leaders outside of organizations and the mainstream media. So the question of word of mouth is absolutely vital today, even more so than at any point in the past. So what are people likely to say both about the organization and the issue? That's an important question to ask. When we think about word of mouth, we also need to consider the valence of what they're saying, whether it's positive or negative. We consider how the organization's portrayed in the media, but of course we should also consider EWAM, or electronic word of mouth, how the organization's being talked about online. Not necessarily only on social media, but that can be part of it. Why? Because third, social media has grown and is so important to how people learn about and understand organizations that how they are engaging with the organization online is a separate outcome itself. When people like a brand, they're more likely to become part of that brand community, which we'll come back to in more detail later on in this series. But beyond the brand community, how are people using social media to discuss, critique, or even support the organization? This is a result of the evaluations that stakeholders make, plus the way the organization communicates with them. But there's also a recursive element to this process. The outcomes always loop back to inform the future relationship between the stakeholder, organizations, and issues. This becomes the new relationship and the new normal. 